yeah so all right so i've started the recording so let me just share my screen and i'll explain about the boot camp just give me one second all right yeah so hopefully my screen is visible now so this is the uh, basic plan so some of it may change so uh, what we will be doing is first of all i'll have a few assumptions so uh, main thing is because dbms is a co-requisite of mad1 theory itself and then this bootcamp has the prerequisite of the mad1 theory so we assume that you have already done the mad1 theory it may even be like one or two terms back so that's fine that's not a problem but then you would have done dbms and mad1 theory right so the basic concepts, the theory concepts of that are prerequisite. So you would need to know uh, some parts of it. So basic parts I have highlighted here, so you can go through them. And uh, it doesn't mean that you have to like know it at the back of your hand. So even if you have read it once while you were doing the course, <clears throat> you can just revise them. So I've also listed a few resources if you're interested. So like uh, a few things which you will need per day, I have listed in the third column. So uh, every day, let's say you're today we are in the day one and then there's something you need to <coughs> revise so let's say dbms or some mad one concept you can go over the few resources in the second time so this is basically the overall rough plan for each day so there are seven days so you have seven days of tasks we have to do so every day we will be covering a few concepts from a video so this is the video in question so uh, the link is there you can check it out later so uh, i'll request everyone to like watch the like, demarcated parts so basically like for day one it's uh, from the starting till uh, one hour nine minutes so obviously the first day i know it was a little hurried so you may not have time to go over it but then yeah, at least after this uh, just try to go over this and then for the uh, rest of the days try to watch the video part before the session starts so uh, we will be following the problem statement and the basic structure of the video directly from here. But other than that, we'll also uh, cover some extra agendas. So first of all, uh, so obviously we'll have some introduction and the plan of the seven days. So that's what we're doing right now. And we'll also have some other things uh, discussed uh, for every day. So I've listed them out here. You can check it out uh, later. And there are also some things which you have to do by yourself, right? So. Uh, this uh, bootcamp, as I said, it's not a lecture. It's it's an interactive bootcamp. So uh, even in the bootcamp, I would uh, like uh, expect you to contribute and interact. And even after the like four hours, so once uh, the session is over, I would expect that you uh, revise some of the concepts that you have learned that day. So otherwise, uh, the project is not so easy to be done, right? So for theory courses, we can just watch the lectures and then get on with it. But then. For a project, you'll have to actually get your hands dirty. So I would recommend either to uh, so obviously while to do it while we are doing the session, but then also after the session, you can uh, revise a few important concepts. So I've also marked it as bold for things which are really important. And yeah, so that's it. So that's basically the structure of this document. And then uh, I'll also add a few things in the resources here and there once uh, something pops into my mind. So these are the rough uh, important resources that I've listed right now. So no need to go through all of them right now. You can, uh, after today's session, you can go through the ones marked as day one. So these ones. All right, so any doubts in this one? Uh, you mentioned uh, we need to see some videos, right? Uh, yeah. What is that video? You gave the link in the first line? That is yeah, yeah, this one, the one here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that That is the video which we will be covering. So this is basically a... Uh, walkthrough of uh, two terms back problem statement, which is grocery store. So we will be covering the grocery store problem statement this term also. So uh, that is not the problem statement we will be making a project in, obviously. But then uh, we can't do the bootcamp in the same problem statement, right? Yes. Because, yeah, so we will be tackling the old problem statement. And then uh, we will be following this video. And then uh, once you're done with this bootcamp, so after the seven days, you will have the experience of how to make a project then then the current problem statement will also be basically the same thing for you because each term the problem statements that change but then the internal concepts is basically the same so there's two things you have to make like a 
category and then a, something inside a category. So we'll get into that all that later. But then the concept of each term is basically the same, just the outer layer is different. So yeah, definitely. So uh, just go through the videos uh, before the sessions, but then obviously first day, I know it's not possible for today's, but then the today's session will be a little light. So we'll go over the basic setting up of the environments and then uh, the Figma design and database design. So yeah, if no other doubts, let's get started with that. All right, uh, give me one second. Let me uh, share my entire screen. Yeah, sorry, my bad. I, I was on mute. So yeah, just give me one minute. Yeah, sorry for the, uh, delay. yeah. Yeah, so hopefully I'm audible now. Uh, can anyone confirm? Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. audible. Yeah, so we'll start with the basic environment setting up. So I don't expect uh, you to know the uh, like design of the problem statement. So first I'll go over the problem statement with you. So uh, how the structure of the project should be. So in general, always Madman project has uh, two things. So first of all, it will be something like a category. So let's say for grocery store, this will be, you can assume like a category of the grocery store, right? So electronics, furniture, something like that. Uh, for music streaming application, it was a playlist. So you can assume a playlist of music and uh, like that. For blog light, uh, I think we didn't have any categories and then, but then we had, uh, friends so that that is a different uh, way to do it and then this term we have library management system so this will have basically uh, genres of books so uh, drama fiction like that and then inside that we'll have some items right so for groceries so let's say this will be items and one category can have multiple items but then one item can only be there inside one category. So that is the basic structure of the Mad1 project. And this is usually in database called a uh, one to many relationship. So the categories can have multiple items in them, but uh, one item can only have one category associated with it. And a category can also have zero items in it. So uh, it is possible that I just created a category and there are no items inside it. So the minimum is zero. Uh, but the maximum is multiple. And, but whereas a item needs to have a category present for it to exist. So item cannot exist without a category. So for an item, the minimum and maximum both are one. And so this is a basic uh, notation diagram of uh, uh, like database modeling. So hopefully you remember this from DBMS. So usually notify something like entities using a box and then 
uh, the item is also a box and then the relationship between the two are denoted using this crow and feed uh, notation so that is usually how all mad1 projects are so the project which we are dealing with this term is called grocery store so here what we have to do is basically there will be two users one is the normal customer so he is also called the user and the other is the admin so admin is basically like a store manager so he will be adding the uh, items and the category so he will be managing what is present in the website so what he can do is basically what is called as crud so in uh, hopefully in mad1 you remember we had crud which basically means create read update and delete right so these are the four operations you can do in a database so basically there are two entities in the project one is the category and the other is the product or item and the admin's work is very simple he can create he can read he can update and he can delete categories and same for the products the customer however he has uh, some other power so he cannot do the crud like the admin but then he has some other uh, things he can do so one thing he can do is he can obviously search for items so assume like you are going into amazon right so you are uh, searching something in amazon so this is basically your customer so similarly the customer in grocery store can search for items then once he finds something he likes he can add to cart so very similar to amazon or flipkart how it works and then finally once he has added some items to the cart and he's satisfied with it he can buy that or he can order basically so these are the uh, in general things that the grocery store problem statement requires there are some other things they also request small things like let's say while searching uh, if the customer sees a product which they want to buy but then uh, no more of that item is there so they should see out of stock similarly while they're buying uh, let's say they, there are five items in the stock and then uh, they say i want six so the applications should, should say that okay no you cannot buy six because there are only five so these basic validations are there which you need to do and they are also part of the problem statement so in the end once you have submitted your project and it has gone for evaluation so there will be two uh, vivas done so there will be a level one viva and then there will be a level two viva so if you pass the level one viva you get to move on to the level two viva so Level one viva in general itself is not a uh, like extensive viva itself. They uh, what happens in level one viva is that they'll ask if you have implemented all these features, right? So one by one they'll ask if you have implemented this feature, this feature, this feature. So the uh, way to pass level one viva properly is basically implement all the features. And then for level two viva you have to work a little harder because you have to know how your code is working and. Uh, know a few theories also because there will be actual viva conducted here so we'll get to this later in like the last day of the bootcamp uh, but i just wanted to let you know how the vivas are structured all right so let's get started so uh, can anyone pitch in how should the uh, project be structured in let's say the like front end part so when i open the project what should i see at first so let's say I open this URL and then uh, this is the page. What should I see there? The welcome screen with the title on. Login page. Yeah, right. So title will be there and then a login page. So once you open it for the first time, obviously you are not uh, logged in. So you will definitely have a login. Do it was to change. Can you confirm that? Hello? Is the screen stuck for all? Yes. Yes. Even rejoining doesn't help. Yeah, maybe you should from each side.
Yeah, sorry everyone. I just lost my internet connection. Uh, just give me one minute. Let me try to join from another system. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes. Yes, yeah, you sorry are. For, sorry for that. Yeah, I just lost my internet connection. So, uh, till what did you, uh, were you able to hear? So, let me just share my screen again. Login page. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so the login page, right? So, usually we will be doing login with uh, username and password, but then other applications do it differently also. So, some may ask for OTP and all. But then because this is the like Mad1 project, right? So we'll keep it simple and we'll just take username and password for the login. So that will be the basic login form. And then we'll also have an option to register. So for people who have, uh, who don't have an account in this application yet, they can click on register and then they will have a register form. So uh, what can be there in the register form? Like let's say for login, we take the username and password only. Uh, what can be there in the register? What details can we take? Oh, yeah, we can take the name. name buttons. Email. Yeah, so email. we can either take email or we can take username. Uh, so we won't be taking both. So that's a choice we'll make while designing the DB. So uh, yeah, let's stick with uh, username right now. So yeah, username will take, right? So whatever we ask for login, we'll also obviously have that for registration. So username, what else? Mobile numbers. Yeah, we can definitely take mobile number, but then, uh, so this one, because we're not doing anything with the phone number, we would usually not take it. Uh, if you're having, let's say, a, like full-fledged application where you're sending SMS to the User, we will also take mobile number. So usually we'll only collect information which we require. So while well, so basically when the user is registering, we don't want to burden them with basically 10 page form, right? So they should just uh, be able to register quickly. So the basic things which we will require is name, username, and the password. So we'll take these three and we don't need anything else for this, but then if you want, you can take a uh, phone number if you're sending, uh, SMS basically. So the registration form will also be pretty simple. Uh, you can also add another feature, which is basically repeat the password, right? So uh, just so that the user knows what password they have given, you can ask the, for the password two times. And only if the password is same in both the cases, then only we let them register. So this is the front end of the page. and But there's one part which we are missing in the back end, right? So, uh, let's say the user opens this and then types their username and their password and presses the login button. So what happens when we do this? So is it just a simple redirection to another page or do we do something else here? Verification. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, let's assume for now that the user has already registered and uh, we already have his data so usually we store our data in some place called a database the database is something which is not accessible to the user directly because uh, they can then see everyone's data so that is not what we want so we have the database and we only interact with it with uh, with the backend so the backend you can assume basically is the python flask application that we have so the backend can communicate with the database and see okay so this user which is let's say user one he is existing in our database and his password is this so what happens is after we press the login the front end will then go and ask the back end that okay this is my username and this is my password so am i the correct person so am i authorized to go in 
and only after the backend has basically gone to the database and checked uh, the data that they then come back and tell that okay either you're correct or you're wrong so uh, after seeing uh, the credentials and after verifying it only then they go into the main page uh, and if the credential is wrong we basically come back to the same page again so if the credential is wrong and if the credential is right then we go to the uh, so for example if it's the user then we go to the dashboard right so let me open a new page so the user user dashboard is basically where he can search for items and then uh, look at the item details and cart them so what are the things we can have in the uh, user main page so just throw out ideas so it doesn't have you don't have to worry about if it's right or wrong different categories which will yeah exactly ideas. Exactly right. So as we said in Mad One, we basically have two things: categories and then items in the categories. So we'll have different categories. So let's say category one, category two, etc. And also inside the categories, we'll have the products, right? So <clears throat> let's say in category one, we have P one. So I'm not naming it nicely. So just for example, I'm just naming it P one, P two. Uh, yeah, uh, search box exactly. So we'll have a search box here. So you might have seen that I've left space for this. So We'll have a search box where the user can search the items, and obviously a button to submit that search. What else can we have here? Cart. Yes, exactly. So two things with cart. So first of all, we'll have a button to add to cart. Right. So let's say I want to buy this product. I'll have this add to cart button. So for each product, we will have that button, and Along with that, we also need a way to go and check out the card, right? So we'll have a card link here. OK, so we are almost done. Some other things which we can add here. We can search based on product or category. Yes, exactly. So we'll uh, have that. So how we will do that is basically we'll have a uh like drop down here basically we'll say do you want to search for category or for product or for something else and so the one which the user selects and then whatever he types here we'll search uh, that category or that product using that search so that's how we will handle multiple searches what else what else can we add profile uh, yeah. those three lines at top left corner yeah exactly so basically menu right so this one I guess you're talking about this one. Yeah, so this is basically called a hamburger menu. So let's say you're on a phone and then you don't have the space to show so many things, right? So someone mentioned correctly profile also. So we'll also have a profile link, we'll have a cart and some other things also, let's say we have. And then in a mobile, we don't have so much space. So what we do is we just uh, give the hamburger menu here. And uh, once they click on that hamburger menu, they get to see all the basically cart and all here. So they'll get the options like this. So one more thing which we need here. So just imagine your Amazon or Flipkart page. So what are the summary? Pages, uh, summary Order are? summary. Order yeah, summary. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So we'll have uh, past orders or recent orders or my orders, something like that. So let me just call it orders here. So here we'll have all the orders which we have already placed. So the main difference you have to understand between carts and orders is that cart is a temporary place, right? So let's say you want to buy this, you want to buy this. So your cart is basically, it's like a shopping cart, right? So, uh, so sorry for the poor drawing, but then yeah. So you just want to buy this. So you put P1 in your shopping cart, then you want to buy this, you put P2 in your shopping cart. And after you have basically seen what you want to buy, then you go to your cart and then you see, okay, I have these things I want to buy. And then you go to the cashier or the register, right? So you go to the front of the store, you take your cart, you give them the uh, products you want to buy, you give them the money also. So that is a very important part. And finally, they do the transaction, they give you the bill. And so with the bill, you have some things like the transaction ID and all. So uh, that basically cements your buying. So that says, okay, now you're the owner of this product and this product is yours. So. Uh, till here, whatever you add to cart, this is not exactly yours. So you have uh, said that, okay, I may want to buy this, but then you don't own this product here. 
So only when you uh, like when you give your money and then you have uh, processed the transaction is when the product belongs to you. So at that point, your card then becomes empty, right? So you then return the card to your shopkeeper and then the card is basically taken up by someone else. So the card becomes empty. But then you get the things and it's given to you. So you now basically, let's say you get a shopping bag or something and you go home with all the items in your bag. So now this is your orders. So something you have bought. So the My Orders page will have a list of uh, all the things you have bought in the past. So let's say it has uh, a heading called My Orders. And what you'll have is basically, so let's say you bought this P1 and P2, right? So you'll have P1, P2. You'll have the name of the products you'll also have let's say the price of the product and what else do we usually have when we go to the my orders page quantity yeah exactly we'll have the quantity so that is one important aspect of this so how many did you buy so because you can buy one you can buy a thousand also so you'll have the quantity and another thing for that transaction so let's say these p1 and p2 i bought one day right like uh, i went to the store i bought these things so this is one transaction. So you may have the transaction ID. And along with the transaction, you may have also the date, right? So when did you buy this? So date of that transaction. So this is the basic outline of your orders page. So you can obviously add other things also. You can maybe add a, a grand total uh, like of the all the items you bought. So all that is fine. And then uh, similarly, we'll have a similar structure for the cart page. So the cart page is a temporary place where you store your products. So it will also have something like this P1, P2, and the price, you know, like what was the uh, individual price, and then the quantity, all that you'll have. And one other thing you'll have in your cart is, anyone can tell? So one difference, like my orders will just have the details. My, uh, my cart will have also something else. Anyone? Uh, editing product or like uh, any pro uh, any quantity, something. Yeah, like that. yeah. You can, uh, yeah. We can have that. So let's say uh, you want to edit, right? So I don't have space here. Let me just uh, add it here. So basically, a button to edit. So for each product, you can let's say change the quantity, or you can totally delete, right? So let's say you are. Uh, in your shopping market and then you put some things in your cart and then you think okay i may i should not be buying this so you put it back so that is basically the edit functionality so that is one thing and what is the other thing we'll, which you'll we'll have like the main call to action or the main button in that page buy yeah. buy yeah exactly right so buy now I believe there is some issue with presentation. Is it stuck for everyone? Yes, I guess. Okay. Yeah, voice issue again, right? Huh? Yeah. Yeah, sorry again. I don't know what's wrong with okay. my network today. It happens, no issues. Yeah, just give me uh, five minutes. Uh, in the meantime, I guess we can all take a five minutes break, right? And then come back. Sure. Sure. Thanks.
Yeah, so, uh, yeah, sorry for the interruption. Let's resume. So, am I audible? Yes, uh, Shan. One, one, one question. Is the recording still on? Yeah, I think the recording should be still on. Yeah, it's on. Yeah. 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 So, as I was saying, right? So, in the cart page, you can, you will have the CTA, which is the button to buy. And once you press the buy button, it will basically go to the back end and then it will check. So it will check if uh, the things you're trying to buy, it's there in the stock and some other things that will check pre processing. And then basically it will finalize your order, right? So this is like the cashier uh, drawing up the bill and then declaring the products yours. So then you go back to the My Orders page and then you have all the orders present there. So this is the overall uh, structure of the user side. But now we also have the admin, right? So for each uh, project, usually we'll have one admin and one customer. For some projects, we also have three types of users. So the web uh, manager, the admin, and the user. So for the admin, what we do is uh, we have the basic CRUD operations for the categories and the products. So when we uh, so first step of the admin will be basically the same as the user, right? So he'll open the page and he'll be greeted by a login page. So in the login page, he will give his details. And basically, we'll have a, a single login page. But then in the login page, we check if the user who has given the credentials, right? So first of all, we'll check if the username and password is correct. So if not, we'll just ask them, OK, this is not correct. But then if it's uh, correct and it is an admin, basically, so we already have the information in our back end, right? So we know who is admin and who is a normal user. So if you see the information is correct and the person is an admin, then we, instead of redirecting them basically to this page, which was the uh, user dashboard where people can search and buy, we then redirect them to the admin dashboard. And admin dashboard will basically be similar to this, but then a little different. So here also we'll have the list of the categories, right? So we'll list the categories. So let's say uh, cat one, cat two, like this. But uh, what are the things the admin can do which the user can't do? Anyone? Create new categories. Yeah. Move a category. Yeah, exactly. Create CRUD operations, exactly. So for categories, let's say we'll have a button which is for creating a new category. So that's the C of the CRUD. And read, obviously, is already there because we are seeing the all the categories. And then we'll have update and delete, right? So for each category, we will have a edit button where the admin can edit the details of that category, and then a delete button where he can uh, delete the category. So similarly, for each category, he will have that. And so one thing we are missing from here. Can anyone point out what is that? So one button we also need. So although we have done the CRUD, so CRUD of the categories is done. We can create, we can read, we can update, we can delete. But still, we need one more button here. Anyone, any any ideas? Why? View button. Sorry, I didn't get it. View. Yeah, right, exactly. So uh, all the things of the categories we can do here. But then uh, there is another model, right? So other than categories, we also have a product model. So we should be able to do CRUD for the products also. And uh, one way to do it is basically we do it per category, right? So we will have a view button here, or open, or anything like that. So as I said, view. Well, let me just put it as view. And there, let's say, so this is category 1, right? So if you press on the view of category 1, what this will do is it will say, OK, so now you're inside category 1. And I have these products. So I have P1, I have P2, et cetera. And now, obviously, we'll have the same type of buttons, right? So here we'll have the edit button to edit the product. And we'll have the delete button to delete the product. So here, we obviously don't have any open anymore. Because inside product, we don't have any other uh, model to show. So we'll have just the edit and the delete. So that will be, in general, the structure of the project. One more thing you can add, which is basically an optional uh, thing, is in the admin panel, you can have a dashboard, right? So once they open the dashboard, it will show them the statistics. So 
things like how many products are sold uh, or what are the trends of products, et cetera. So basically graphs. So you can add some plotting and graphing there and the admin basically will be able to see, okay, these are the uh, statistics of my current store. And another thing we can add here is export data. So basically, let's say the admin sees all this graph and okay, that's fine, but then maybe he wants to perform some other analysis on this, right? So he may want to download all this data as a Excel file, right? So for that, we will have a download button where they can basically download everything as a CSV or an Excel file. So this is in general, the basic layout of uh, the project, which we will be doing. So the admin can log in and then he can create, read, update, and delete the categories, and then create, read, update, and delete the products. And uh, so this page, we may be doing it in the last session. And for the user, we basically have the login, the register, and then the main dashboard where they can search for products, where they can add to cart products, and then the cart page where they can see the products and they can maybe change the details. And then finally, they can buy, and then they can see the my orders. So, and we'll also have a profile page, obviously, as you pointed out. So there they can basically change their details. So username, password, first name, last name, all these. So this will be the basic wireframe of the project. But now let's create like uh, some real tangible UI, right? So this is good for making up things really fast. So you can just have a pen and paper and draw it up quickly to understand how your project should look, but then we should also have a proper UI design first before starting the project. And then you will be, you may be like that. Uh, why do we need to design the UI so many times, right? So already I have a wireframe. Let me just start with the coding. But then uh, speaking from experience, I'll tell you that uh, if you skip that step, it will basically be still there. You will still be doing that, but then it will take you maybe twice as long. So it's better to design the UI first uh, in, a, in some UI designer uh, platform. Uh, such as Figma. So Figma is something which we will be using for this bootcamp. And I also highly recommend everyone to at least try your hand at Figma. So you don't have to be very good at Figma, but then you should know the basics of how to design simple UI layouts. So I've also added a resource in the uh, sheet for Figma. So after this session, if you want to learn uh, better details of Figma, you can watch this session. Uh, yeah, Prakash. Is it fine if if we export uh, from Figma and use it as a template? Is that okay or it's not uh, advisable to do, do that? Uh, you can do, but then uh, the thing is, uh, if you export from Figma, right? So usually the layout, it may not be responsive and other things may be there. And also for the Madman project, we only use Bootstrap, right? So for the UI, uh, we will be like, for the front end, we will be using Bootstrap. So the Figma uh, export will basically be hard coded. So all the styles will be hard coded. So it may also be hard for you to change something. So one of the things in level two Viva is that the external may ask you to make some minor changes. So the changes may be in backend, it may be in logic, but then it can also be in UI. So in that case, you may face difficulty. So if you have designed your UI by yourself using simple things like bootstrap, then I would say it will be easier for you to do that for the uh, Viva also. So my recommendation would be to use uh, Figma to design it, but then uh, while making the project, you can use the basic HTML and CSS to come up with the structure. Because anyway, okay. we will be using Jinja, right? So we can't hard code the HTML part. So the structuring, the templating yeah. will be done using Jinja. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> All right. So yeah, so just open. So I hope uh, most of you or all of you have joined via laptop or desktop. So just open uh, this website here, figma.com on your uh, system and just log in and then just create a new, right? So you can create a new design. And uh, so I had created this earlier, but then let me go through this again with you guys. So uh, the way we create designs is let me create it once again, once more again. So this is basically how Figma works. So it'll be given a blank canvas. So basically an infinite by infinite canvas. And then here you can add multiple pages, right? So you can see here I have added one for the login page, one for the register page. And 
uh, your UI may not obviously end up looking the same as your UI design in Figma, but then this will give you the rough structure of how your UI is supposed to look or what is the skeleton of the project. So yeah, so the basic way, I'll uh, just go over the basics of how to uh, do some stuff in Figma. So first of all, let's uh, use the rectangle tool to create the uh, each page, right? So if you come here and if you select the rectangle, you can now draw a rectangle. So don't worry about the shape. You can simply come here and set the width and the height. So usually for a normal uh, monitor of a desktop or a laptop, it will be 1920 by 1080. So let's just stick to that resolution. And we can also set the fill. So the fill is basically the color. So let's just set the color to FFF, which basically means white. So this is basically the hash code. So if you don't know hash, you can just click here and then drag the color to white. Uh, if you do know hash, you can just basically type FFF because that is white. All right. So once you have selected, uh, like basically created the canvas, right? So which is a rectangle. Uh, so look, let's start with designing the first page, which is the login page. So once someone opens the uh, project first, they'll not see anything else. They'll just see the uh, login page. So we'll have a top bar at the top. So let's just create another rectangle for that. So I can just select this. And you can see that it is automatically snapping to the corners, right? So uh, these are one of the features of using some like uh, like specialized tool like Figma. So if you can also do it, obviously, in MS Paint, right? So but then you won't have these features. So yeah, let's have a top bar like this. And then we can maybe set the color to something or we can set it white and then have a stroke, right? So outline, basically. So I can press the plus here in stroke. And now you can see there's an outline. So these are the basic ways how you can uh, design your UI. So let's say we have the name of the application here at the top left. So for that, I can either press T or I can go here and click this T. And then I can drag a box here, which will be basically be the text box. So here I can, let's say, name the project as, so let me set the color first to black. And I can name the project, let's say, as grocery or something like that. And we can also set the size to a bigger size so that it's visible. So all of these are basic UI design. So uh, there's no hard and fast rule of like you have to set the text to this much size, or you have to do this, or you have to put it here. But basically, all of it depends on how what is your design choice, right? So what you think looks good, what you think look bad. So that's totally up to you. So I'll just ex like demonstrate a few options so that you're familiar with the platform. So as you can see earlier, it was like this also. Although the box is the full size, the text is at the top. So we can basically click here, which is align middle, and now the text is in the middle. Similarly, if I want the text to be in the uh, horizontal middle also, I can click this. But I think this is fine. So yeah. So let's say we also have uh, a few links here, right? So one for register, one for login. So we can again click t, uh, like press T on our keyboard or go and click the T here. And we can, let's say, add some other text boxes and set the color to black. And we can, let's say, type register. And maybe we have another text box which says login. So sorry. So one is register. And now I'll show you another feature, which is cloning. So if you are just clicking something and then dragging, so it will move that box. But if you hold the Alt key on your keyboard, and if you, so you can see the cursor from black, it becomes two cursors, right? It's one black and one white. So when you click the Alt button and then you drag, so it basically clones the item. So, so right now it may feel like, OK, what's the big deal? I can just create another text box here. But when you are working with a uh, big design, so let's say you have made this entire UI and then you want to create another page like this, so which, which will have uh, very uh, similar details. So let's say this is the user profile, and then I want to create the admin profile page where just one thing will be changed. So I can just hold Alt and click this, and the entire page I can duplicate. So that is the power of Alt clicking. So let's say, yeah, that we have uh, register and we have login, and then we are in the login page. And here we can have a heading here, let's say login. 
and I can set the color to black and maybe we can increase the size. So I won't go into uh, much details of designing. So I guess that is done way better by uh, the uh, session here. So you can just watch this after this session if you are uh, interested to learn how to make very good designs in Figma. Uh, but this will just be a basic uh, overview of how to use it. So, so let's say in the login, we'll have uh, two entries, right? So one for the username and one for the password. So what we will do is we will have a text box here and it will say username and we'll have a rectangle here which will basically be the input where the user types and so another thing let's see how to round the corners of this text box right so you can see here one icon of a uh, corner here so you can just click here and drag and it will slowly increase the radius of your rectangles so you can see you can make it totally round or you can make it partially rounded something like that and yeah you can basically play around with your design you can let's say change the fill color to white and you can have a stroke and maybe you don't want the stroke to be throughout right you maybe want just the bottom part to be stroked so that also you can do here if you click this stroke per side and instead of all you can just select bottom and as you can see, there's only a stroke in the bottom. And maybe you can change the stroke width also. So you can change this to obviously change the stroke width. So let's say we set it to two and then set it to bottom. So now that we have created this uh, UI, so we have the username and the username selection. Uh, sorry, one second. Yeah. So we now have a basic template of how to take input. So now I want to make similar thing for password and the password input, right? So one way as we saw is we can do control, uh, sorry, we can press Alt and we can drag, uh, but that will just clone just one, one thing at a time. So the username thing is copied and then I can click here and I can copy this. A better way to do this is uh, just select this one and then press control and select uh, sorry press shift and select this one also so now both the items are selected right so now you can uh, press shift a and it will become one component itself so now this username and this uh, input it is still like separate entities you can edit them you can change them but then now they are together one frame as you can see here frame one and now if you just uh, press con uh, alt and then drag them you can simply clone it and now you, you can make it a password here so this uh, pressing shift plus a is basically creating a frame and the frame allows you to do multiple things so inside a frame you can also align things so if you want them to be aligned to the top or the middle or something so all and if you want them to be top to bottom or one of the other order so this is similar to how Flex and Flexbox works in the CSS. So we will learn that later in week three and week four, sorry, uh, day three and day four. So yeah, just explore the Figma more and how you can add other things and maybe uh, make it more beautiful. So I'll not go into much details of that. So let me just add the login button here. So for the button also, we can basically have a rectangle and then uh, let me make it a little bit smaller and a little bit rounded or maybe fully rounded and so because this is the main button or the main call to action button cta button maybe we can uh, give it an accent color so it, the color can be anything but let's say we are keeping it green or something like that and then we can add a text inside which will say login and then we can make it centered and maybe the size can be a little bit less all right so this was a basic uh, demonstration of how to make uh, one page in figma so now I, what i want you to do is uh, not just watch through this right so also do it by yourself so open this page figma.com and create an account and then create a project and then just try to design uh, a few pages right so login is something we did Maybe you can try register also, which is uh, similar. 
but then what I want you to actually try your hands on is the main page, right? So as you can see, there are multiple components here. So there's a search, there's a category, there are top bars. So a lot of items are there. And while you're making this, you'll stumble across multiple features of Figma, and that will actually make you learn. So I don't think just watching this would uh, help you. So just open this site, and then just try creating a few layouts. So yeah. and if someone is uh, confident enough or uh, if you want to, uh, I would encourage you to share your screen so that we all can see what you're doing. So I'll stop presenting temporarily now. And I'll encourage everyone to open this. And also, I'll encourage you to share your screen. But then that's up to you. If you are shy, you don't have to. But yeah, open the figma.com. So I'll send the link in the chat. and create a basic design for the uh, user page, user dashboard page.
Hello. Shannon. Yeah, hi, Professor. Uh, there's something in voice. Sir? No, I'm hearing something. Okay, sorry. I can be from the Yeah, hopefully, all of you are trying a basic design, right? So just try out a design based on the user page. And yeah, let's see the designs by like 11.15 or 11.20. So once you're done, so yeah, I'll just ping back at 11.15.
All right. So hopefully, all of you have uh, tried your hand at designing something, some layout in Figma, right? So what, what I want you to do now is uh, at the top right, you can see a share button, right? So wait, let me share my screen. Yeah. So you can see in Figma, uh, so you can see at the top right, there's a share button, right? So just click the share button and then click this copy link and just paste it in the uh, Gmeet, right? So we can look at the various uh, designs we have made. So just share your uh, Figma design in the chat and then we can uh, maybe look and take inspiration from each other. I hope someone has made something because yeah, that is the main reason for this boot camp, right? So if we just have me doing it, then it won't be much useful. So yeah, just uh, share the links of the whatever you've done. So it doesn't have to look good or be well polished. So yeah, I guess we have one contributor. Uh, yeah, I guess. Oh, OK. Never mind. I think we have to do some things here. Yeah, so you can uh, come here and select anyone with the link. I guess that you have to do. Uh, it is not done at first. So just uh, click the share button and then select this one. Anyone with the link can view and then copy the link and send it. So yeah, uh, Pranitha, maybe you can do that. And others also just uh, click on share, then click on anyone with the link, and then copy the link and send it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. It's opening. Yeah, right. So, exactly. So, I guess you're designing the My Orders page, right? So yeah, this is the basic way you will be designing. So you'll make a canvas, and then you will add the elements inside it. Perfect. And so this is just one uh, product. And then similarly, there will be other products. So you can just uh, all click and then drag it to make multiple products, and you can uh, add their names. Right. So you have also framed them correctly. So yeah, nicely done, Pranitha. Uh, anyone else? I see only one link here. So hopefully others are also doing. Maybe you are high enough to share, but then, yeah, Prakash, thank you. So yeah, it's fine, uh, because we only got like 15 minutes, right? And you are not familiar with it. So that's fine. Uh, yeah, so basically something like this. So you're designing for the learning management system. Yeah, so this is the basic uh, tool, uh, which is called Figma, which we will be using for designing. So yeah, thank you, Azhar. So let's just see some of the designs. Uh, I think you have to do that, right? So you have to come and click on share, and then you have to click anyone with the link, because uh, otherwise we can't see it. Yeah, so just uh, do that and let me know. And yeah, so basically, that is uh, this is the tool which we'll be using to design. So your task after this session would be to basically come up with the design of the pages, right? So as you can see, the login, the register. So I have uh, shared this link with you. So you can obviously go over this and take inspiration. But then obviously, this is not the uh, best uh, in any way. So this is a very minimal UI. There are way better UI designs. So let us see this one. So if you want to learn more about the UI design, yeah. So yeah, this is, I think, nicely done. So it just started out, but then it looks uh, well polished. So yeah, just keep on uh, working on this, keep on adding this. And yeah, we'll have a really nice UI design. So uh, you can look over this for the page structures, maybe. And then you can also uh, refer to the resource, which I linked for how to do nice UI designs in Figma. So, now let's uh, move a little bit into coding itself and uh, the database structure. So at first, uh, we will look at how the database should be there, right? So uh, yeah, let's see another Figma design. 
two more and then we'll move it to it yeah so good that you all are contributing okay this is i think really nicely done so yeah keep it up and yeah so you're working on the grocery uh, store itself right yeah great yeah perfect and let me see this one also yeah perfect exactly so this is the basically the way you will be designing your pages and then once you're satisfied with the or the way it looks you will be cloning it into your actual code so yeah thank you actually you people are doing it so i thought no one was doing it but yeah good yeah exactly right the like this only you will be designing the page so i think you will have to have uh, like canvas also in this so something like 1920 by 1080 below so that we can understand what is the size of the page but then yeah this will how this is how you will be designing the uh, components and then we have also framed it right so yeah perfect all right see there also let's see yeah exactly so i think this is very similar to what i designed right so yeah so this is for the library management yeah perfect yeah so we'll have some credentials and then some password and some login so similarly uh, design for the other pages also so i'll just uh, uh, can you just repeat the copy part with shift key? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, it's not shift key, but then what you do is basically there are two things. So first of all, let's say you want to uh, group some things, right? So let's say I have already grouped this and this. Uh, so like these two and these two. But now let's say I want to group these uh, two groups also with themselves. So I can press, sh uh, press and hold shift. And I can click this and I can click this. So what shift does is it allows you to select multiple items. So now they are both selected. And now if I press shift A, so now they are both part of a group. Right. So some things uh, may cause some problems. So another way to group it is uh, using the uh, uh, control G. So you can press shift and select two items. And then you can press control plus G. And this will also group them. So as you can see, this is also in a group. There are two frames are inside the group. And uh, maybe we need to move it below so that the other things are visible. Yeah, as you can see. So this is basically the uh, like the order in which they are shown. So this group is uh, ordered below these things so that these are also visible. So you can select using the shift. And if you want to group them, so there are two ways. One is uh, making it, them a form. Uh, sorry making them a frame that is using shift a and another is making them a group so right now we created a group using control plus g but uh let's say we undo this yeah so now they are just uh, separate frames right so i can select this and i can select this so right now these two are two separate frames which are selected now if i press shift plus a so wait let me turn on my uh screen maybe that will help you so let me see if it's working yeah you can see my keys right in the below yeah so i can first of all uh, select them by pressing shift and then clicking them so i've pressed shift and click both of them so they are now selected as you can see and then i can press shift plus a so what this will do is it will make the entire thing as a frame so as you can see this is one frame which has two frames inside so this is one frame and this is one frame so now and this frame this automatically understood that i want it uh, one below another so as you can see the layout is vertical but maybe you want it horizontal also then we can click here and do this or if you want it to wrap also we can do this so this is basically how we will group things another way is using control plus g so if you don't want to make a frame but just want to make a group so that's how i've done the uh, previous uh, pages so these all pages are done using groups and not frames so you can use both i think frames has some uh, more functionalities and usages than the groups so i think you should go with frames so you can learn more about it in the resource which i link so i think he's more qualified in figma than me but yeah this is the basics of uh, how you can design the pages 
So just try to design all the other pages also. So don't copy this directly because then you can also copy because then you'll still learn how to do things in Figma. But I would recommend you also try to come up with your own design. So you will also learn how to design stuff in Figma as well. So yeah, now let's move into a database. Or I think, yeah, we had some other examples also, right? So we'll see these two and then we'll move into databases. Yeah, right. So this is, I think, very nicely done, as you can see. So he has used multiple colors to uh, like basically catch your eyes. So you can see, okay, so these are the links, and then this is the main part uh, of like the current, right? So the quantity of each category. And then the search bar also. Yeah, so nicely done. And we have this one. Let's see. Yeah, exactly. Right. So uh, maybe you want to like uh, scale the things uh, with the uh, canvas, right? So the canvas you have set more or less correct uh, resolution. So maybe you can set it 1920 by 1080. And yeah, so basically that will be one page. So maybe you can try scaling this to that page. So yeah, the skeleton is nicely done. You can maybe add some other details also. Yeah, perfect. All right. So now let's move away from Figma and uh, let's see how we can design the database. Right. So uh, hopefully you remember the basics of DBMS, which was done in the DBMS course. So the main things which we will be requiring from that is, uh, first of all, the modeling. Right. So uh, what do I mean when I'm writing something like this? So if I draw, let's say, user, and then I draw something like this product. So you should know what this is. So basically a simple ER diagram, right? So uh, those things from the DBMS, if you don't remember, it's better to revise, but then yeah. And then what does lines mean and what does uh, triangles mean basically? So all these, so triangles basically means relationship and then the squares are uh, entities, right? So things which actually exist. So a user who actually exists, the products which actually exist. So a category may not physically exist, but then it is also something that exists, right? So these are our entities. And then there are some relationships between these entities, right? So what can be a relationship between a user and a product? So how are these two related? One too many. Mm. Yeah, the cardinality is fine. So yeah, we'll get into that later. But then uh, how are they related? So let's say I say this is one person, and then this is one person. And uh, I say the relationship is uh, son and mother. So this guy is the son, and this guy is the mother, or something like that. Or let's say I have uh, another guy and another guy. And I have a relationship between two. And I say these are the business partners. So uh, I can understand, OK, these two are related by the business they do. So what is the relationship between a user and a product? So what so can is in the cart of the user? Many to many? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, we'll get into the cardinality after this. Yeah, it's many to many. Uh, but then, yeah, as uh, I don't know who said, but then, yeah, it, uh, we can have them in cart, right? So a user can have a product in his cart. So a cart is a relationship which can exist between them. And yeah, you were totally right that it uh, can be many to many. So a user can have multiple products in his cart, obviously. And because we have uh, multiple quantities of the same product, so one product can be carted by multiple users also. So it will be a many to many. And obviously, a user can cart zero items also, and a product can be carted by zero people also. So it's, it's a very bad product. No one wants to buy it. So this this is the basics of uh, ER diagram. So how we will first model out what the entities in our project are. So the reason why we do this and not just jump into creating the uh, database and all is because clarity, right? So for any project, what we need is clarity. So it may seem redundant at first that, OK, why are we drawing things on paper when the end product needs to be a actual thing which works, right? So but all the uh, all this is done so that the developer has more clarity while working on the project. So 
uh, once we move on into the coding part, you will realize how important these things are. So they do nothing else but help us to understand how to create the models. So one relationship between the user and the product is starting. Uh, what can be another relationship? Anyone? Order. Yeah, exactly. Right. So this is just a temporary place in his card, but then he can also finalize the order. Right. So that will be so sorry for the terrible diamond shape, but then yeah. So this will be order. So basically the same thing. So a user can order multiple products and then a product can be bought by multiple users. So the cardinality is same. And so there is also one attribute which is associated with uh, both of these, which we have missed out. So user has multiple attributes, obviously. So that's up to user. And then a product has multiple attributes, obviously. So a user has basically the username, the password, the name, all that. And then a product has multiple categories, like its ID, its uh, name, and which category it is, and all that. But then uh, what is one attribute which is only present in this relationship? So only when a user has some product in his cart, does some attribute exist. So what is that? Quantity, price. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the price will be the product's price. Product. Uh, yes, but the quantity. quantity will be something that only you know, right? So uh, only when you add some product to your cart, you basically select, OK, I want five of them, or I want 10 of them. So that is a attribute of your relationship with the product itself. So similarly, the order will also have the quantity. And one thing you correctly pointed out also, that is price. So the price of the product is attribute of the product. But then once you have ordered it, so the price may change, right? So let's say this is a typical graph of the price of the product. So this is the time, and then this is the price of the product. So the price may go up and down anytime. So the price attribute of the product will always uh, tell what is the current price. But maybe let's say I bought the product here at this time. So I also need to know what was the price at that time, right? So what we do is we also store the price in the order also. So this price may or may not be same as the product's current price. So yes, the price is also a relationship attribute. So similarly, product and category are also related. So I don't think we need to explain what that relation is. But then, uh, yeah, anyone can tell what that is? One to many. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so, about yeah. attribute. Category has many uh, contains. Category contains. Yeah, yeah. Basically, right. So in or contain something like that. So uh, basically, uh, a product can be uh, only exist if it's inside a category, right? So uh, one category can have multiple products, but then, uh, as you said correctly, the product can only have one category. So there cannot be multiple categories of a product. So it is possible, uh, but for this project, we will model it like this, that because that is also how the problem statement is. So each product will have only one category. And also, a category can have zero products also, but then uh, each product, for them to exist, they need to have a category. So here it's uh, basically compulsory, and here it's mandatory, uh, sorry, optional. So that's the relationship between the category and the products, and then uh, similarly, so that's, I think, basically all the relationships. So we may be missing out on something. Let me see. So the cart, the order, and then the category. Yeah. So that looks basically like all we need. So let's design the tables now. So by seeing this now, we can uh, have a rough idea of how the tables should look like. right? So. Uh, let's start with the user table. So what are the fields of the user table? Like, uh, What are the uh, columns, basically, of the user table that we will have? So just from seeing this, we can uh, have a guess. Uh, username, password. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we will have uh, username. We will. So one thing which I will get into, so I won't explain too much right now, but then we will get into it in the next days, is uh, so let's say I stored the password, right? So I stored the password here. 
and somehow let's say my database gets breached so some person hacked my server and then he got access to my database so what will happen is he will be able to see my password right so you can just uh, see that okay this guy's name is uh, john is the, is his username and his password is 1234 so maybe this application is not that important to you that, okay what is the problem if that hacker got to know my password of this application but maybe let's say you share the same password to something else right so some people do that they create one password for every website so if this website security was bad and uh, the password got leaked so now your username they know and let's say this side instead of username they use as an email right so they basically know your email and they also know what password you had for this website so there are high chances uh, you may use this password or something like this in another website also so this is a very uh, high security risk so what we usually do is we never store password in our database so you may be thinking okay then how will we even authenticate that okay when i'm logging in uh, let me go to the top yeah when i'm logging in how will i know if the uh, person is giving the correct password or not so uh, the topic is pretty deep and uh, heavy with theory and mathematics so we will not get into it but the basic thing is what we do is instead of storing the password we store a password hash so you can think of hash as something which is like uh, let's say you take your password put it in a mixer grinder and then you turn it on and what comes out is the hash so obviously it will not just depend on the password but it also depends on username and some other things and the way the password is verified also is a little bit theoretical but then we don't have to worry about it because we will be using some libraries which will handle that for us so what we need to know from the developer uh, perspective is that we don't store the password but then we store the password's hash so yeah the username is there the password is there another thing which we had is the name right so name of the user so we will have that and one more thing so let's say we allow the user to change their username right so multiple platforms do that they let uh, the user uh, change the username so in that case it may be a problem if we have just the username right so uh, maybe i'm identifying the user with the username and then they change the username so what's uh, a better practice is to also have a user id user id we will generate a user id yes exactly so we'll have a synthetic uh, key which is the user id and we'll use that to uniquely identify the uh, basically each row of the user so you can call it user id or you can call it just id so i usually prefer to call it just id so it's totally up to you how you name your attributes so for user we will have basically these four attributes the id the username the password hash and then the name so let's think how the attributes should be so i think this one we already know right so the id will obviously be the primary key so this is uh, how we identify the each uh, row from each other so the id will be primary key uh, what constraints do you think the username should have unique yeah exactly so the username it, it is not the primary key which we use but then it has to be unique so no two users can have uh, the same username it has to be unique so the password hash is there any constraints on it minimum eight characters yeah we can have those right so min uh, but then that won't be in our database, right? So, uh, yeah, basically I have to, uh, I have not explained how hash works, but then uh, let me give you a very simple demo. So this is not exactly hashing, but then it will explain the thing. So let's say I have the uh, password as 1234, right? So as we said, we will not store the password, we will store the hash of the password. So let's say the hash method is something like uh, shy 512 so you don't have to know what this is uh, but then i think it was covered i'm not sure so basically some function which is like a mixer grinder so it will take your password one two three four and give out some value right so as you can see even if my password is one two three four the hash is very big so even if my password is very big also still the hash will be the same size only so we can't actually in the database say that it has to be minimum this many characters because the hash will always be uh, a fixed number of characters 
So, but yes, we will have this uh, min character in the database. Uh, sorry, in the backend. So, when we are setting up the account, so let's say when registering, then we will like uh, manually check if the password given by the user is this many characters, and then we will do that. But then, yeah, that is not part of the database. Uh, any other constraints of the password hash? So it's obviously none. not unique, but in, yeah, exactly. It will be not null. So it has to exist. So a pers person cannot create an account without a password. So it will be not null. And for name, let's keep no constraints right now. So maybe someone does not mention their name. So let's allow that. If you don't want to allow that, then this one also will be not null. So this will be a basic schema for the user table. So similarly, for the products table, or let's say for the categories first. So for the categories table, it is even simpler. So we don't have uh, much details of the categories. Uh, we'll have one synthetic ID, obviously, to uniquely identify it. Uh, other than that, we'll have the name of the category. And that's it. So we have only two things for the ID. So the ID will obviously be uh, primary key. And because it's primary key, it is unique and not null. And the name, it will be not null. So you can also say it will be, it has to be unique. So that's up to you. Uh, you can also make it unique, but then let's just keep it not null for now. So next, oh, I think we added something in the middle, but then yeah. Uh, let me, yeah, let me write here itself maybe. Yeah, so next we will have the product, right? So what are the attributes for the product which we will have? ID, first of all. Yes, exactly. So we'll have an ID, which will be unique and not null. So which will be the primary key, basically. Uh, what other details do we have? Name. Category. Yes, name is there. Yes, exactly. Category. So uh, category, we do not store the name of the category, but then we store the category ID. So we can name it maybe cat ID or category ID. That's up to you. And what is this, this category ID? Uh, foreign key. Yes, exactly. So it is a relation to this. So it is foreign. a foreign key. So foreign this key. will be a foreign key. So this basically tells which category I'm talking about. So I don't have to store all the details of category here. We just store its ID. And then with the ID, we can refer to the category. And the name obviously will be not none. And what else do we have for the product? Price, quantity. Yes. yes, exactly. So price and then uh, quantity. So this quantity is basically how many we have in our stock. So not something which the user is buying. So that quantity is different. And uh, this quantity is the quantity of products in our stock. And we can also have, let's say, manufacturing date. So when the uh, product was manufactured. So let me just write mandate for that. So this all this will be basically just not none. So there is no other constraint for this. Yeah. All right. So is there anything else? I don't think so. Let me see. ID is there. Name is there. Category. Price. We can have five. Category. We can have. We can have five. Five. Another thing. Five small, medium, large, and etc. All those attributes. Uh, so they will get you. Uh, we can have size for uh, small, medium, large. Size, so yeah, yeah, yeah. We can have size. We can also have uh, another thing, which is like say Color. for the uh, quantity, right? So let's say it is a bag of rice. So for rice, we will say like it is unit. So we'll have one bag or two bag or three bag. But then let's say we are uh, selling oil also. So for oil, we usually sell with liters, right? So one liter packet, two liter packet, like that. Or uh, rice also we sell in kgs also. So maybe a better would be uh, something like, let's say, lays. So lays will be only packets. So it will be one unit, two unit, like that. So we can also store the uh, like what the quantity means, right? So for uh, one item, let's say rice, one may mean one kg. For another item, oil, one may mean one liter. And again, for lays, one may mean one packet. 
So we can also have the unit. So I don't have any space to write it here, but then, yeah, let's say the unit we can store. So this will usually be like a string. So you can store that. I don't think I've done that in this project, but then yeah, you can definitely add this. And as you said, the size also we can add. So if it's a small, if it's a medium, if it's a large item, all that we can add. All right, so these are the entities. As we saw, we only have three entities, the user, the product, and the category. But we now also have, uh, so this relation is one to many, right? So uh, what is one thing which is the property of one to many relationship is that we can directly uh, encapsulate that relationship in the table itself. So as you've seen, we have mentioned the category ID, which is a foreign key in the product table. So because a product can have only one category and it has to be there. So we can just have like store its ID in this table and that's all we need. So from the foreign key, we get to know which product belongs to which category. But let's say for this one, a product and a user who has carted. So a user can cart multiple products and a product can be carted by multiple users, right? So there's no way for us to uh, create a new page. There's no way for us to, in the products table, uh, store the user details. So I cannot write like user one ID and then user two ID like this. So it is not possible because there may be thousands also. So we cannot add it in the database directly of the product. So what we do is for many to many relationships, basically, uh, for many to many relationship, which is basically like this, for, which where both the items can have multiple of each other. What we do is we create a joint table. So a joint table is basically nothing but for that relationship, we create another table. So uh, these earlier tables were for the entities. And now for the relationship, we'll have tables. So uh, what are the two relationships we have? One is cart and one is order, right? So what we can do is we can create, uh, sorry, we can create a table for cart, which is a joint table. And here we are basically just storing the details of the two other entities. So because uh, one is user and one is product, what we do is we store two things. One is users, or do we store user? ID. Yeah, exactly. So we store the thing, which is the unique identifier of the user, which is the ID. And for the product also, we store the product ID. So if it was uh, a, like a relationship with no attributes, that's all we need to store. But uh, as we said, for cart, we also have uh, attribute, right? Which is quantity. Right. Yes, exactly. So the quantity we store in this table also. So this is separate from the product quantity. So the product quantity is the number of quantity, like number of products that we have in stock. Whereas this is the number of this product that this user has put in his cart. Right? So not to be confused. And uh, in the cart, we may also need to add a like synthetic ID just to uniquely identify each row so this does not have any meaning to the uh, like relation itself but then yeah so the user id will be a foreign key the product id will be a foreign key and this is just not null so this has to be present but then no other restriction and then this is the primary key so similarly we'll have for the orders table so what do we have for the orders firstly we'll have the id and then it will be same as these, right? So it will be user ID and product ID. We'll also store the quantity, same, same as cart. And what is something else which we store in the orders? So I guess we just discussed this five ten minutes ago. Right. Yes, exactly. So the price, because the price may change after we buy it. So we want to store the price at which we bought it. Uh, another thing which we can store is the time at which we purchased it. So the date time so that uh, in the receipt also we can show, right? So you bought it at this time. And one way is to do it like this. Uh, but then what happens is uh, 
let's say you buy three items uh, item let's say p1 p2 and p3 and so you are user one and your friend who is user two uh, also bought the same three items p1 p2 and p3 but there's one difference so let's say you are a very planned person and you know you want to buy these things so you open the website you add this to cart you add this to cart you add this to cart so you add all of the three products to cart then you go and you press buy and you buy this and your friend let's say user two is a very like haphazard person right so he does not plan anything so he just went on the site today morning and he carted this and bought this Five minutes later, he remembered. Okay, I need this also. So he went again. He carted this, and then he bought this. And then again, uh, five minutes later, he remembered. Okay, I need P3 also. He went into the site. He carted this, and he added this. So what is the difference between these two? It's basically, obviously, you, both of you have the same uh, order history in the end, like the number of products. But then, uh, for you, the order history it will be one transaction, right? So the difference is the transaction. But for your friend, it will be three transactions. So for you, it's one. For your friend, it will be three. So right now, the way we have uh, structured the data, it's not possible for us to uh, understand if the product, like if two products were bought together or bought separately. So one thing which we can do, so I didn't Cart include ID it in the, it. yeah. Uh, so I didn't include it in the. Uh, ER diagram so that it's not too confusing. But then, yeah. So what we do is we again create another entity which is called transaction, right? So uh, cart we can use. Yes, we can also have the cart ID. So, but then the thing is the cart will be removed, right? So let's say once you add something to the cart. So let's say this is your shopping cart, and you add some things to it. Then you go to buy. So what happens is. Uh, this all these items p1 p2 p3 it will be moved into your order history so your orders are still there and then your card will be cleared right so as you may have noticed so once you buy something from amazon you will see your card is empty so that is because you can again go and add things to your card so your card should be always available so uh, once we buy something the card becomes empty so we cannot add the card id because uh, this id itself will be deleted so one simple way is we already have all these details. So we just create an entity called transaction. And this just stores the details of which thing is bought together. So transaction is uh, simply one second. Yeah. So the transaction is simply storing the uh, details of, first of all, its own ID and then the user ID. So who is the user who bought this? and uh, thirdly the date 10 because uh, all the trans like all the products all the orders in one transaction is obviously done at one time so the date time we can store directly in the transaction so now what we can do is we can remove the date time from the orders and we can also remove the user id because it is already stored in the transaction so what the only thing we need to store in the orders is the transaction id so now the transaction id which is the foreign key it will automatically linked to this and from here we can see okay what was the user id and what was the date time so that is how we can uh, get these details and because now we have the transaction id so now we can open both of your uh, like orders table and we can see okay both of you have uh, p1 and then p2 and then p3 in your table but then for you it's uh, the transaction id is one one and one Whereas for your friend, it is one, two, and three. So we get to know that, okay, these are separate transactions. So that's how we can have the transactions uh, and the orders. And the product ID is also obviously a foreign key to the product. So I'm not drawing the arrow, but then you get the point. And the quantity is not null, and the price is not null. And this is the primary key. And then similarly, this is the primary key. This is the foreign key uh, to the user somewhere. And the date time is not null. So just try to uh, take in how the tables are created, right? So for the orders and transactions and card, these are the joint tables. 
so this do not represent any entity but then the relationships and <coughs> then for the user and the category and product these are the tables for the entities so just try to write this write this down yourself somewhere maybe or if you're planning on doing the library management system maybe you can think of the uh, table structure of that if you're working on some other problem statement you can work on that although for this project we will be working on this grocery but then yeah just try to come up with uh, some use case or some project and then uh, note down how the database design is supposed to be so this will help you design your database when you're working on your project also so let's take a uh, let's say 15 minutes break and then let's resume at 12 15. is that fine and in that 15 yeah, minutes sure. you can come up with a database for yourself it's time break for me i can yeah. have a meeting for yes yeah. sure, sure so let's let's join uh, so let's be in the meeting itself but then let's come back at 12 15. If that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Right.
All right, hopefully all of you are back, right? So uh, just let me know if you are back. So maybe you can just raise your hand to uh, let me know that you're back. And then, yeah, let's resume. Yeah. All right, I guess six or seven are here, and then uh, rest are maybe still not here. So I'll just put it in the chat. So raise your hand if you're back. Let's start. All right. Yeah, so let's uh, give the others, let's say, one or two minutes. So maybe they're not back yet. So yeah. And then in one or two minutes, we'll start. All right. Yeah. So yeah, let's uh, start now. I think uh, the others will join soon. So I'll just lower on. And uh, yeah. Let's start. So, yeah, we have uh, covered the basic wireframe and the Figma design and database design. So, hopefully, you guys also tried to come up with some database design, right? So, I won't be asking you to scale it, but then, yeah, do try to come up with a design. And then, uh, even after this session, also just come up with uh, a basic uh, database schema for uh, a project which you think uh, would be similar, or maybe for your problem statement. So now let's uh, start working with the code and the terminal, right? So uh, how many of you are, let's say, fam familiar with the terminal? So it doesn't have to be the Linux terminal, but uh, even, let's say, the partial or command line of Windows. So uh, just a show of hands. So yeah, Sridhar, Tanishk. Yeah, so some of you are, right? So uh, not to be worried, even for people who are not uh familiar with it so uh we will be starting slow only so it's fine and i've also added a resource here so you can uh, this or wsl and get so if you are uh so i'm assuming uh, people who are not familiar you're running windows only so if you're running linux uh, most probably you are familiar with the basics of terminal but yeah if you are running windows and not familiar with partial or terminal uh, I'll highly recommend you go through this uh, video. So this will cover the basics of uh, WSL and Git. So uh, I'll cover them too. But then for your reference, I've also added a link in the resources part. All right. So uh, let's get started with the uh, projects directory first. So for our Mad1 project, uh, it is uh, not very complicated. So what we will have is we'll have one, let's say, project file. So let's say Mad1. So this will be folder. So let's say you open your uh, desktop, right? So you open your desktop and uh, let's say you're in your documents or something. So these are the folders. So uh, somewhere in your some uh, folder, you have this Mad1 folder. So this is where all your code will be placed. So inside your Mad1, uh, the only things which you'll have is basically uh, one or more Python files. So let's say we call it app.py. So I am uh, assuming that you people are familiar with Python, right? So it was in foundation level. So .py is the extension for Python files. So we'll have app.py, and then we'll, we may also have some other files also. So that is totally up to you. But then we'll usually have, so because the app.py becomes very big, right? So it becomes around one to 2,000 lines. So it's very hard to navigate through them all. So what we do is we break out some of the code two other files also so like the models.py and the routes.py like that so there's no hard and fast rule that you have to do it like this but then this is usually the uh, like the simple structure which we follow and that's also what we will be following in this so we'll not start by creating all of them at first we'll just start with the app.py and then slowly we'll make the others all right, so the other thing which we do need is a folder called templates. So most probably you have, uh, you remember from Mad1 theory, right? So 
the, uh, the Flask uses Jinja, and Jinja uses templates to render the HTML. So the templates reside in the folder called templates. So the forward slash basically means it's a folder. So this is a file, and then here, this is the folder templates. And inside templates, we'll obviously have multiple files. So I'm not listing, but then obviously you'll have uh, for each page which you are showing, right? So like this page and this page, for each page, you will have uh, some uh, template files. So this will be some HTML files, so .html. So the templates folder will have multiple such files, but then you get the idea. So this is the templates folder. This will have the uh, HTML files. And then there's also another folder which we have, which is called the static. And the name here is also something you have to like stick to because uh, the other names like the sap.py and model.py, you can name it anything. But this templates and the static, so usually you don't change the name. So this is exactly the name you stick with. So it has to be lowercase, and it has to have an S for templates and no S for static. And the static is a folder where we store all our basically static things, right? So let's say some images. So images we can store maybe in a folder inside called images, and it will obviously have multiple .jpg and .png files. So let's say you're adding some image for each product, right? So you can add the product image. So we won't be doing this here, but then you can definitely do that. So and maybe you have some reports, so you can have a PDF folder, and you, inside you can have uh, multiple .pdf files. So this is basically the static folder contains all these types of files. So you can also have uh, the style sheets, right? So the CSS style sheets, you can store them in uh, a folder or simply directly under the static file, a static folder. So all these are stored inside these statics. And so basically, this is the bare bones template. We won't be following a very detailed template. We'll have just the static folder, the templates folder, and the app.py and some other py files. We'll also have a requirements.txt file. So what this is, we'll uh, get into it later. But this basically stores uh, the name of all the packages that you are using in your project. So basically, in Python, uh, that there are two ways to do this project. One way is basically you uh, install everything in your system, right? So let's say for this project, we need things like uh, Flask. And we need things like, let's say, Jinja 2. Or let's say we have SQL Alchemy. So one way to do it, and which I will not recommend, and which we won't be following, and I highly uh, recommend you not to use that, is basically just install it in your system. So you just install everything in your system, and then you do it once, and then for any project you are working on, it will just work. But then the problem with this is uh, maybe these things are installed in your system. So this is your system, basically. So. Uh, sorry for the bad drawing, but then, yeah. So it is installed in your system, but then let's say you share this code with someone else. So they have no idea what are the things. Right? So if they open the code, maybe they can see, OK, you are importing Flask, you are importing SQL Academy, so maybe those are required. But they don't know. So there's no one place where you have listed out all the things that you are using, and they don't know what to install. So maybe let's say you have uh, thought about that, and you listed out all the installed packages right so we will get into this later but uh, i'm just uh, covering it shortly so there's a command called pip freeze and you can use that to just list out all the things installed in your system so let me just demonstrate so let's say this is your terminal and you type uh, pip freeze so what this will do is it will list out all the things installed in your system and you can see there are multiple things installed in my system because i'm not just doing the madman project right so i may be doing some data science i may be doing something else so lots of things like jupyter and all everything is uh, there so if you just do this and then give this to your friend your friend will be like okay do you expect me to install like this 500 packages so it makes no sense right because for this project you only need class jinjain sql and and something like that so what we do is for almost all development so not only in flask and python but also if you're doing some node.js which you will doing which you will be doing in mat2 so what we do is we create an environment inside the folder so environment is nothing but you basically say that okay forget all the packages i have installed in my system uh, imagine i have nothing installed i just have python and all the like the pre-installed things of python obviously and i have pip which is used to install things in python I just have this inside my virtual environment. So 
virtual because obviously it's not a real another system and this is just i'm virtually telling it to imagine that this is a system so then you will be like okay so how do i run flask if i don't have flask installed so i will say don't install flask to my system install all the things which is basically this flask and jinja and all into this virtual environment so what will happen is so after you have configured all the things you want so let's say you've installed this so in your virtual environment you'll have just python pip and then flask jinja sql and maybe all this so you'll have a total of let's say 10 to 12 packages installed in this vm so if you do pip freeze inside this vm now it will only have uh, like 10 to 12 uh, packages here so this is very much handleable so you can now like give this output to your friend and tell okay just install these 10 to 12 things and what he can do is he can also create a vm inside this folder and he can also install exactly these uh, packages so what uh, this is basically the reason why we use vm for virtual environment so there will be a folder in here which uh, is like not uh, shared to your friend or anything which is called vm so it can be named anything and we will be calling it vms and this will have all the python virtual environment details so we don't need to worry about what's inside or how it is set up so we have just one command which will set it up for us but then we have to know that okay this folder is there and usually this folder is very big so it's around uh, 10 to 50 megabytes right so why i'm stating this is because this will uh, come in handy when you are at the last stage of packaging your project and submitting in your portal then you will see that uh, okay you have zipped this entire folder and it's coming out as a 70 mb so and the portal is not accepting your project right so you don't uh, you won't be able to upload that so what you need to do is actually you don't need to uh, include this vn part in your zip so what you do is you delete this part and you just upload everything else and that is fine because you are including this requirements.txt which is a list of all the packages that you have installed. And once you give someone this, they can just use this requirements.txt to recreate the VN by themselves. So this is, uh, you are not losing any data when you are removing it because someone can just recreate it uh, and they will get back it. So Tushar is asking if we create a VN and install all packages and then submitting it will be, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm telling, right? So that's not a problem because VN is not some, uh, VM folder does not have any information about your project. So when you are submitting, you can simply delete this folder or not include it in the zip. So that is something which people face problem in and think, okay, VM is uh, like root of all evils and we should never use VM. But that's not the case. The, the main problem is because you uh, do not know not what to include in the zip. So VM is something you can remove while zipping. And because you have the requirements.txt, uh, so when someone unzips that zip, they can simply again recreate the VN by simply running one more command, which is pip install. So this is the basic structure of how the project will be laid out. So do you have any any like anything which is you don't understand? Otherwise, we'll start creating the project in the terminal now. Anyone any doubts? All right, so yeah, I guess you will be having lots of doubts, but then you may not have them right now. So yeah, let's get into it. And then as and when your doubts pop up, you can ask them. So uh, I highly recommend you go through the WSL basics if you don't know how to work with a terminal. Uh, but uh, so we'll start slowly on how a terminal works. So basically a terminal is a way for you to write uh, code like instructions so it's like instructions or like recipes to make something which you tell your computer directly so even when you are let's say using your computer with a mouse and you open some like folder like this and you're double clicking these are also instructions going to your computer right so you're telling okay i want to go inside this folder or i want to go inside this folder so these are all instructions you're giving to the computer but using the mouse so you cannot really understand what instruction is being sent because it's all abstract. You are clicking something and then something is happening. So terminal is also a way to give instructions, but then you write it out. So you can see exactly what you're writing and what is happening to your system. So what will happen is uh, if you, so I'm assuming you have at least WSL install or at least PowerShell install. So just open PowerShell if you're on Windows or if you're on Linux, just open a terminal and 
you will usually be inside your home directory. So if you do PWD, which is print working directory, you will see something like this. So if you are on uh, Windows, I think uh, you use DIR to see the uh, items in your directory. If you are on Linux, you'll use LS. So you can see, OK, I'm in my home directory, and I have some folders. So just go to some folder where you want to open the, like create the project. Or if you're on Windows, one way to do it is open the Explorer and then go to that place where you want to create. So let's say you want to go to Docs and you want to go to Projects and there you want to create. So just click on the top part here and there you can type CMD and press Enter. So obviously this won't work here, but then for you it will open the command line exactly at that place. So let me go to a place where I want to create the project. So let's say Docs and Projects and then here. so. The first step is to create a folder for the project. So uh, we create a folder using the mkdir command. So we make a directory. So mkdir means make directory. And we let's say we name it uh, grocery. So once we have made the directory, so as you can see now, uh, if I ls, so the folder should be here. Yes, you can see grocery is there. So I can now cd. cd means change directory, or basically it's the same as double clicking in the explorer. I can cd into grocery. So now I am inside the grocery. And you can you can know that because it's telling grocery here. If you're not sure, you can type pwd and see, OK, this is my current path where I am in. So it's home in my name, documents, projects, grocery. So I'm in this folder. So the first step in any project is usually git initialization. So you may be uh, wanting to, so to skip this part, like, OK, I will not use git. But then git is something which you will require for Mad1 and Mad2 shortly, because uh, they will slowly integrate it into the project. And also git is something you will require in your daily, uh, day, like daily work if you are working in any development or data science thing. So uh, yeah, Prakash. Uh, is it fine to check in in Git? Because I heard in some other meeting, or uh, we, we don't have to, or, or it is not uh, advisable to get have it in Git because uh, the tool which tries to find whether we copy or something like that will create some problem. Yeah, see, so that is uh, one other misunderstanding is uh, Git versus GitHub, right? So. Git is a tool to version control. Okay, your code. Okay, yeah. 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 And Sorry. GitHub is a website, right? So right now I would advise you to not push anything to GitHub. And uh, but then there is also a, another way to do it, right? So I'm not getting into much detail of it. But then the thing is, if you want, you can push it to GitHub also. Just remember to make your Git, GitHub repository as private. So okay. I got yeah. it. Yeah. 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 If you Sorry. open GitHub and uh, just go to create a new repository. So you can just make it private, and then everything is fine. So uh, the uh, plagiarism checker will not consider it if it's private. So okay. yeah, I'll I'll share a link with all these also, so you can go through it later. But uh, right now, let's just focus on Git and GitHub. We can focus later. Yeah. Sorry for asking your question. No, no, that's fine. So, so all the bootcamp is for asking questions only. So that's fine. So yeah, the first step is basically initializing Git. So Git is something Git and GitHub both are something you need in your daily work, uh, regardless if you're working as developer or as in data science everywhere. So Git is a tool which almost everyone uses. So uh, it's very useful to learn Git. And it's not that hard to start off. So basically, inside this folder, let's say I want to now create a new repository. So I'll just type Git in it. And what this does is basically it is now initialize the uh, current folder as a Git repository. So if you do ls, you will see there's nothing changed. So there are still no files in it. But uh, as you can see, it says uh, it has created a folder. So the reason we can't see is because it's starting with a dot, so it's a hidden folder. So in Windows, also, you have hidden folders, right? So similar to that. So you can do ls a to see all the files. And there you can see, OK, no, this git folder is there. And we don't really have to worry about what's inside. So it's uh, we don't have to care about it. But I'll just show that it has some folders and files which basically helps Git to remember, OK, what is uh, which code is there and then uh, how has it changed all that? So now that we have initialized the Git, so what we can do is we can create some files. So let's start with creating a, a readme so that we can start off and then we'll move into code after that. So one popular uh, text editor people use is VS Code. So for simplicity, I'll be using that as well. So to start VS Code in your uh, current directory, you just write code and then 
put a dot. So dot means the current working directory. So if you press enter now, you will see VS code opens in your current working directory. So right now you can see there is nothing in our folder, right? So it's empty. So we can just uh, click this to create a new file and we can, let's say, create a readme.md. So this is not a code file. This is basically like a manual, right? So whenever you buy something, you get a manual with it. So you can, so you know what it is and how to use it. So this is uh, similar to it. So we can simply write some details. So we, are, we won't be focusing much on this. So grocery shop application. And let me increase the font a bit. So hopefully it's visible now. All right. So this is basically how you use VS Code. So if you're not familiar with it, I would recommend you to install VS Code and play around with it. So installing is pretty straightforward. You can go to uh, VS Code download, like you can search this on Google, and you uh, usually the first link will work. And you can go there and you can uh, download. So if you're on Windows, you can download for Windows. If you're on Mac, uh, you can download for Mac. For Linux, I think you can download directly from your package manager. You don't have to come here. All right, so let's start by writing a few uh, lines of code. So let's start with the app.py. So this is a Python file. So here, uh, first, first let's see how we uh, set up the virtual environment, right? So right now, if I say, let's say print hello, all right, so this is now a file and uh, Inside this, we have told print hello. So if we run this, it should just say hello, as you can see, hello. So right now, if you are running this, it is running with our local systems uh, packages which are installed, right? So uh, all the packages that I uh, showed you, so if we do pip freeze, uh, let me, yeah. If I do pip freeze, you can see there are so many packages and everything is loaded along with this. So we don't want that. So what we will do is uh, another piece of uh, code we will write in the terminal itself. So you can either write in the CMD or uh, in the VS code itself. If you open the terminal, you can uh, you will basically get a terminal here and you can type the code here. So here also basically the same terminal works. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So in this terminal also you can type. So you can type here or you can type here. So what we will do is we will run Python dash M V E N V and then the name of the folder is also V E N V. I'm keeping the name same because it's a little bit confusing which one comes first, but then basically Python is the name of the uh, interpreter which you're calling and then dash M means we are calling this module. So M is for module and then V E N V is a, a module which helps us create a virtual environment. And then we are also naming the folder as V E N V. So just press enter and it will take some time. And then you can see that it has created a VN folder, right? And also VS Code tells us we notice that a new environment has been created. Do you want to select this? So we say yes. So now we are in that environment. And let me close this terminal and run a terminal again. So I'm not sure if it is activated now. But then uh, if you run which Python, it will tell you which Python it is running. So right now you can see it's still running the actual Python, right? User bin Python. So the way we activate this virtual environment is by typing dot or source, anything is fine, uh, and then the path to this. So this will be venv slash, there's a bin folder inside. So you can see there's a bin, so bin and then slash activate. So one second. Yeah, so you can type this source when been activate. And what this will do is it will activate the virtual environment. So now if you type which Python, you can see the path has changed. So earlier it was user bin Python. Now it's the exactly the place where you are right now, right? So inside the projects in grocery, and then inside that when bin Python. So now uh, the Python which we are running will be running using this virtual environment. So this is what we want to do so that anything we install or we create will be stored in this folder itself so that we can simply uh, create a requirements.txt and uh, hand it out to our friend who wants to run this. All right, so let's start off by installing a few things which we need for the project. So 
hopefully you're already familiar that we are using Flask for this, for the backend. So we'll install Flask and that will in turn install Jinja and everything. So we'll also install Flask SQL Alchemy. So don't mention just SQL Alchemy because that is a separate package which is also installed by this. So this is just a wrapper on top of SQL Alchemy. So SQL Alchemy uh, is there for handling the database and then Flask SQL Alchemy makes our life a little bit easier. So we have Flask, Flask SQL Alchemy, and also we will be installing python.env. So if you are joining from your laptop or your system, I would highly recommend you to follow along, or at least if you are uh, planning on watching the recording again, then I would recommend you to watch that and then follow along also. Because if you're doing it parallelly only, then it will be uh, it will make any sense to you. So we install, so we have to write install also here. So pip install. So we'll install Flask, SQL Alchemy, Python.env, and uh, I don't remember what else we need, but then we can install that later also. So right now, let's just install these three and press Enter. And Pip will basically go to the internet and fetch all the things and install it. So we don't have to worry about how it's working. And then, yeah, it's done. So if you do Pip freeze now, you can see there are, so let me increase this. So you can see uh, it's not as big as this one, right? So this was my local systems installation, and there are multiple things installed here. But once we are in the VM, it only has the things which we installed right now. So these other things, don't worry what these are. These are basically packages required by Flask. So when you tell Pip to install Flask, Pip is like, OK, but Flask needs these packages also. So these are also installed. Similarly, Flask SQL Alchemy installs SQL Alchemy also. So, and then Worksug is also a package which we will be using directly, but we didn't install because Flask installed it uh, indirectly. So Worksug is a package which we'll be using for security purposes. So for creating and verifying the password hashes. All right, so once we have uh, installed the things we want, so we can do pip freeze as you saw to see the list of the packages. And But uh, seeing this is not enough, we want to store it as a file. So one way to do that in Linux is you do uh, Linux and WSL both, is you give a forward slash, so forward bracket. So what this will do is it will take whatever the output this command gives and store it in a file. So we want to name that as requirements.txt. And if you press Enter, you can see now there's a file created, requirements.txt. And that has all the requirements that we saw earlier. So whenever you install something using pip install, so we may need to install something else also later. So just remember to also do pip freeze requirements. So this will just basically save that uh, list of installed packages in your requirements.txt. All right, so any doubts still here? I know I covered a lot of topics, so many of this may be new to many of you. Yeah, it, 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 it would be great if you can give me two minutes so that we can, we can try out these steps, initial steps. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, sorry? Is it, is it fine to ask yeah. questions? Yeah, 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 sure. So you, maybe you can take, uh, I would say, five, 10 minutes. So let's, yeah, let's join back at one. And then uh, by then, hopefully, you have tried to replicate till here. And if you have any doubts or if you're stuck anywhere, just let me know. We can maybe share the screen and resolve it. Thank Hope you. that's fine. Yeah. All right.
I just created this uh, virtual environment, but uh, you you are using uh, Windows, right? Or you are using other Linux OS? But yeah, I'm using Linux, but then this will work on WSL also. Okay. Okay. So once you've uh, created the uh, virtual environment, what you have to do is you have to activate it. So for that, you use the source command. So source. Uh, VN slash bin slash okay. actually. Actually, I'm doing that. Maybe I'll just share this if you don't mind. Yeah, sure, sure. Go ahead. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yeah, I can see the screen. Yeah, actually, what I'm doing is I have a Ubuntu, I mean, a, a WSL installed a separate yeah. version of Ubuntu here. Yeah, I'm perfect. in the same uh, path. Actually, so I I installed. I mean, I created this virtual environment here. You can see in the VS Code. Yeah. Uh, did you create it while you were inside the WSL, or did you create it when you were in Windows? Uh, I created it. Um... Yeah, I think you made it when you were Windows, right? Because yes. The way the VNV is structured is a little different in Windows and in WSL. So yeah, what you can do is uh, just uh, delete the folder and okay. in the WSL you can try to make it again. Yeah, now from the WSL itself, try to make the EVNs. Uh, okay, I just have some permission issues, I believe, yeah. Um, okay, uh, I'll just try to rectify it by myself. Yeah. Uh, I need to change some folder and things like that. Yeah, I'll do All that. Right, yeah, yeah. Uh, let me know if it's working. Yeah, sure. But if not, what, another thing you can try is you can make it in the Windows itself, and then I think the activation script is located somewhere else. So I'll let you know where it's stored. I think inside lib and, and instead of activate, it's activate.bat. So you can okay. turn it on using that. Yeah. Okay, I'll just try to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So hopefully others will also just try to uh, set this up, right? So if you are facing any issues, just let me know. Uh, so I'm not much familiar with WSL, so I'll I'll see how to get it done in WSL also. But then the the basic structure will be the same and the initialization steps will be the same. So let's just try it out and let's resume at 1 p.m.
All right. So hopefully you guys have tried out to set up the virtual environment, right? So if, if anyone is facing any issues, then let me know. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, so this is where we left off. So we had created a VNs and we had installed some things and we had stored those requirements in the requirements.txt. So hopefully you are following along and uh, you have tried to set up the VM. If it's not working for now, leave it out and try to do it with the local environment itself. But try to do the installation and the uh, pip freeze into requirements.txt. So for you, if you're doing it without VM for now, your requirements.txt may be very big, uh, but then that's fine. So once you figure out how to run the VM today, you can then switch to VNV and then overwrite it. So basically, if you run uh, this command again, it will overwrite what was there. So then your requirements will become short. All right. So now let's uh, start creating a very basic Flask application. And then we will pick up from this tomorrow. So in uh, Flask, what we do is, first of all, we need to import it. So we do from Flask import Flask. And uh, this is the name of the package, and this is the uh, like name of the class which we are using. So the uh, main thing you have to do is you have to create an application. So you do app equals flask.name, right? So and as you can see, there are some recommendations coming when I am typing this. So if I am just typing, uh, let's say, app, I'm getting this equals flask name. So this is using a extension called GitHub Copilot. So you can also install it. So what you have to do is in VS Code, you have to go to extensions. And uh, there are a few extensions which you should have to make your life easier. So one is GitHub Copilot. So for this, you need to create a, a GitHub student developer account to get the trial, so free trial. And so all this you can look up online, how to set up GitHub Copilot and all. Uh, another thing is the Jinja. So because we will be using Jinja, so it's better to have some Jinja uh, extensions. So I have this Jinja, better Jinja, Jinja snippets. So you can install these. So what this will do is if you're insta inside a HTML file, you can easily get the Jinja snippets instead of typing it. Some other ones are obviously the Emmet, which is now pre-installed in VS Code. So you don't have to install it. I don't think you can see it even here. But then, yeah, this will be there. and then. Uh, some others are there, which I will mention as we go along. So right now, if you want, you can uh, install it after this class, the uh, GitHub Copilot one. So uh, there are basically pros and cons of using this. So first of all, as you saw, it will give you some suggestions. So the pro is you don't you don't have to remember all the syntax of everything. But the con is that if you don't know what you are doing and you are just following the suggestions, uh, so two things. First of all, your code may work, your code may not work. Right. So it is sort of, or uh, at the end, just suggestions. So it may be right, it may be wrong. So you need to, first of all, know the library and the code enough to understand if the suggestion is correct or not. And secondly, if you are just following the suggestions, then uh, two things may happen. First of all, it may be plagiarized if you are totally using suggestions. and But the chances are low. But the second uh, and more probable thing is uh, you may pass till Viva 1, but then in Viva 2, it will be very evident to the external that you don't know how your code works, right? Because in Viva 2, you will be asked questions regarding your code. And if you can't answer why something is happening or what the code is doing, then you may fail level 2. So better to understand how the code works and then use the suggestions as a tool or as an aid to your development instead of just relying on it. All right. So uh, the app we have created. So the app is basically what is uh, running the Flask uh, the web server, right? So there are two ways to run it. One way is simply how you run any Python script. You can do Python uh, app.py. So what this will do is it will just go through the script from top to bottom. So if you're doing this, then what we have to do is we have to do, first of all, we need to create a route. So we will just make a simple route where we will just return hello. So right now I'm not focusing on anything. So I'm just creating a route. So this route is basically telling if I'm going to that, uh, let's say, uh, let me move this one second. So if I go to that local host, uh, whatever the URL may be, if I go to just slash, so this is the a page which should be rendered if I go to slash. Instead, if I, let's say, make it home, then if I go to slash, it will give me an error. And 
only if I go to home, it will show me what I'm trying to see. So for the base one, let's keep it slash, and it's also called index because it's basically the index of the entire web page. And let us just simply return hello here. So now we have set up the routes. What we need to do is we have to basically make the run. So uh, one thing you may see in most Python projects is these, uh, this line, if name equals main. And what this does is basically uh, you can think that this will only run if you are calling this uh, basically file, you're running this file directly. So there are two ways a file can be run, right? So one is if you are running it like this, Python app.py. And another is, let's say you are in app.py and you are importing, let's say, some other file. So let's import file two, and there's a, a file two.py. So if you now put the same thing, if you now put the same thing here, and if you say if name is main, then print hello, or uh, yeah, print inside file two. Yeah, so if you do this and if you save this, so if you do python file 2.py, so it'll say inside file 2. But if you are inside a, a, let's say, Python interpreter, or let's say just Python, and if you do import file 2, then you see there is nothing being printed here. So this file is still being run. So I can show that by telling here, let's say, uh, inside file 2 uh, globally, or let's say, uh, before import. Uh, so let me open the Python again. And if I do import file two, uh, you see this line is being printed, but this line is not being printed. But if I run this Python file two, then both the lines are printed. So this basically is a check to see if you are running the uh, script directly or if you are if this is being imported by someone else. So let me remove the file right now. So I don't need this file. All right, so in our main file, what we will do is we have created the app and we have set a route of that app. So now we just do app.run. So app.run will tell the Flask to run. And then debug equals true is basically a way to uh, see the errors. So sometimes we may make errors, right? So usually the error will be shown in the terminal. But if we set debug equals true, it will also show it in the browser web page also. So this is usually helpful. Another thing it will do is whenever I make some change and save, this will automatically restart the server. So that is also useful when we are creating the application. So let's have it on right now. And if I save it, and if I, first of all, let me source that virtual environment. So then activate. And yeah, as you can see now, I'm in the VM. So if I do which Python, I'm in this folders Python. And if I now do Python uh, app.py, so now you can see the Flask server is running. So, and it will it'll give us a link where it is running. So I can open this link and you can see it is telling hello. So this is telling hello because I have returned hello here. So this is, I would say the like uh, most basic way to run a Flask server. So we have already now successfully set up a Flask server. So this is a web application. So whenever we make a get request here, it is returning some response. So right now the response is simply a string because uh, we have kept it simple, but then this can be a HTML page also. So now uh, let me uh, go over another way of running Flask server. So this was using the Python uh, app.py, right? So the same way you are running any other Python application. Another way to run it is using the Flask uh, run. So for this to work, we need to set some environmental variables first. So if I do this, uh, you will see it's working because our app is named app.py. And Flask run does, uh, in fact, expect the file to be named app.py. But let's say it was named something else, let's say main.py or run.py, then this would not have worked. So the way to fix that is we basically set a environment variable where we set the name of the file in where the uh, like where the main base point is started so and it, you can also see that the debug mode is off right so even though here debug is true this is actually never run because when we're doing flash run it just goes through this file and searches for this app and because it's not run directly as we saw earlier this part is never run right so this app dot run is never run so even if i put debug equals true or false here doesn't matter because flash run is just going through this file, basically like importing the file and just uh, using all these to create the server. 
So right now it is still running. So if I reload, I can still get this, but then it's not running in debug mode. So one way to fix this is using secrets. So what are secrets? Secrets are basically something you uh, store, you want to store in your program, but then you don't want to have it in your program file directly here, right? So let's say I want to uh, make some secret, let's say secret uh, password or something like that. And I want to make it equals one, two, three, four, five, six. So if I store it here in the code, if I share this code with anyone or if anyone sees my code, then they will also get to know my password. So this is not only for password, but let's say you're also using some API. So for the API keys also, this is not a secure way to do it. So what we do instead is we use a file called VN. So let me just here create a file called, uh, sorry, not VN, ENV. So I know it's a little bit confusing, but then yeah, this VN is the virtual environment and this is a file where we store our secrets. So for the Flask, uh, I don't remember exactly what are the names, so let me just see quickly. Yeah, so the two things, so first of all, as we saw the debug was false, right? So what we have to do is we have to set Flask debug, uh, so there's an underscore in between, and we have to set it to true. And then we also, so if, for now, if it's app.py, it's fine. We don't have to include this line. But if our file was named something else, then we also had to say class cap equals with the main.py or run.py, whatever the name is. So this tells class that, OK, start running from this file. So for app.py, it is auto directed, but then we can keep it. OK, we'll just set two other things. So I won't explain this too much, but then this is basically for us, for the database. So once we are getting into the database tomorrow, this will make more sense. But we will just set the SQL Alchemy database URI. So this is basically the location for the database. Right? So we are using SQLite, which is a file-based database. So this needs a place to store it. So we'll just say, just store it as a name of db.sqlite3. And then another thing which we do is SQLite, SQL Alchemy add modifications. And we set it to false. So this is something which sometimes gives some error if you don't set it to false. So just to be safe, we'll set this to false. And another thing is a secret key. So the secret key is used internally by Flask, not by us directly. But then we do need to set it. Otherwise, it uh, gives some error. So let not, let's not set it right now. And when it's required, we'll see how to set it. So we've set the ENV. And as you can see, the main important thing is this one, Flask debug is true. So because it's set now, if I do Flask run again, now you can see debug mode is on. And now it is running with debug mode. So debugger is active. So if there is some error, so uh, let's maybe change this to pass or something. And because it's debug mode, it basically reloaded the entire server, right? So now if I uh, re reload this, as you can see, there is some problem. And we get the error in the terminal. But also, because the debug mode is on, we get the error in the web page also. And this is usually a better way to look at it, right? So we can. Uh, read the errors in a better way. We can also see where the error comes from. So, okay, so the error is the view function for index did not return a valid response. So we can understand, okay, yeah, so because index is not returning anything, we didn't return anything. So that's why this is happening. So we'll just change it to return hello. All right, so now if we refresh, this is working. So this is how a Flask server is run. So the env file, we can just store if flash debug is true and flash cap. And now we will also see how to import all these envs, right? So we have uh, these two are read by flash directly, but then this one, the location of the uh, SQL alchemy, uh, and this one, whether to set it on or off, uh, these are not read directly from the env file by anyone. So this we have to provide directly to the app and to the DB. So this will be done by using a, a library called .env, which we have installed, if you remember. So we installed python.env. So we'll look into this tomorrow when we are uh, learning about configs, right? So I think it's tomorrow. Yeah, config.py. So we'll get into depths of it tomorrow. So for today, we'll just uh, try to create a basic template and then see how we can render it using Flask. So first of all, as we know, we have to create a folder here named templates where we store everything. So you can create it using mkdir templates. 
or you can create it using this add folder, uh, whichever is more uh, easier for you. So as you can see, the uh, templates folder is created. And here we can create a file, let's say index.html. So now this is a, a HTML file, but this will also support Jinja. So Jinja is basically a templating language, which you might have uh, learned in Mad1 theory, right? So now instead of uh, telling uh, return a string, hello world, <laughs> what we can do is we can, first of all, sorry. First of all, we can come at the top and say, along with flask also import a render template so render template is a also is a function present in the flask library which <coughs> renders uh, html files which may have jinja in it into a pure html so we'll come here and we'll make it render template and then we'll give the index.html path so this is the name of the uh, template and Flask knows automatically to look into this folder. So we don't have to mention templates slash index.html. It is smart enough to know that all templates will be present in the templates folder. So return render template. So what this will do is it'll open this file, it'll render it. So what that means is it'll call Jinja and it'll say, okay, if there's some Jinja code in it, so let's say I have something like uh, variable one. So it'll parse that and it'll get its actual value and put it there and then it will convert it into an actual html and then it will return that so how will i so how will jinja know what the value of variable one is well we provide that here so while calling render template if you want to pass any variables we'll simply do var one equals hello let's say that is our variable and now because inside we have this var one now if i open this and reload uh, because the server is not running so let me rerun the server and if we reload you can see hello is being printed so this hello is not coming from a fixed code so not coming from a fixed html but then the hello part is variable so uh, a better example of this would be so let's say i am printing hello name so here the hello part or the greeting part is always same it's part of the html but let's say I want the name to change. So depending on whoever has logged in, I want to greet them. So I'll change the name of the variable to name. And let's say uh, change it to any name, let's say Jack. So now if I run this, it'll say hello Jack. And doesn't uh, I don't have to change the index if you want to change the name. So I can just change it here and make it John. And it'll basically say hello, John, then I reload. So that is the basics of uh, how templating works. And I would recommend you like revise the basics of templating. So you can go through um, this one, Jinja documentation, which uh, so th there, are, there are a lot of pages here. So you don't have to read everything. Just go through the quick start guide. So let me see where it is. There should be a quick start guide here somewhere. Uh, or you can go through the Flask documentation. Also, there will be a quick start guide there. So yeah, quick start guide. So just go through the quick start guide of Jinja and Flask. And so the basic templating, I hope you remember. So what we will do is let's create the login page today. And I won't delve much into templates today. We'll cover that tomorrow. But then let's make the basic login page. So let me open the Figma. And let's try to create this page, right? So a very simple page, it will have one text of login and then one uh, input of username, one input of password and a button. So the button and all will not work. We'll just make the front end part of it today. All right. So. Uh, first of all, for in uh, HTML, so as you saw, it was called HTML till now, but then we were not actually returning any HTML, right? It's just a text. So in this one also, it's just a text. So what we need to do is we have to actually create an HTML. So for that, we can create the boilerplate using Emmet, which is pre-installed in VS Code by just typing exclamation. So if you just type exclamation and press enter, it will give you a basic boilerplate. So just press fab three times and then uh, the title you can set, let's say, grocery. 
So what this will do is now, if you reload this, you can see the name of this tab is grocery, or you can say at the top, it is telling grocery. So maybe you can say grocery stock application, and you can see that the title changes. So this is a basic uh, HTML. I won't revise that. I hope that you remember that from Mad1. So in the body, let's add some basic parts. So let's start with the uh, heading, right? So it's run login, and then we will have the this one, right? So usually, this is something uh, which is contained in a form. So a form is basically a way of taking inputs from user and then submitting it into the backend again. So for that, we will use form. And one good thing about Emmet is that you can uh, not only this boilerplate, which we did using exclamation, but then many things we can automate very quickly. So let's say I want to make the form. If I just type form and press enter, it will create this form tag, as you can see. So it will open the tag, it will close the tag, it will also add the action. So similarly, I can also say form colon get, so it will automatically put the method equals get right here. And if I want for, uh, form colon post, it will make it method post. And we can also uh, set the class of the items using the dot. So all this is Emmet. So I'll recommend you to learn more about Emmet if you have time. So if I do, let's say, form dot form. So what this will do is it will create a form, and it will set the class as form. So I can also say, let's say, form dot my form. And so this will create a form tag and put the my form as the class. So this is useful when you are setting CSS styles. So we won't get into styles today. We'll do it tomorrow and day after tomorrow. But then, yeah, once you are uh, creating the CSS styles, you need to have some classes for your elements so that you can refer to them in the CSS. So let's just create a basic form right now. And yeah, as you can see, uh, the copilot will again recommend us some uh, suggestions, right? So it's telling, let's create a form group. So this is usually a good practice to have a form group to have the label and the input. So this label and the input, as you saw, we also did the same thing. So we had a, a label and an input, but then we also had it inside a group, right? So if you see here, we had one frame which had the text of username and which had the rectangle. So usually it's a good practice to group these two in a form group. So we'll create a div class. Div is basically an empty container. And then in there, we'll have the uh, label and the input. Similarly, we'll have a password and password. And we'll have a submit button, which is saying login. So if we open this now and we reload, we'll see we'll have a basic form here. So this is not looking uh, very good. So there's no styling in this. So we'll add the styling tomorrow when we learn about Bootstrap and how to use Bootstrap. So right now, I just wanted to show you how to create basic pages in Flask and Jinja. So in here, uh, one thing you can see that if I type username, let's say John, it's showing. And if I type password also, it's showing the password. So one way we can uh, so one way we can make this hidden, right? So it should show like the star or something like that. So one way we can do that is we can change something here. So anyone, any idea what we can change? Type password. Yes, exactly. Right. So type text means this is a text input. Similarly, type number means it's a number input. And we can also make it type password. So what this will do is it will understand, OK, so this should be hidden. So as you can see, it is now showing as dots. And also, you most browsers like Chrome and Firefox are smart enough to understand if there's a type text and there's a type password, then it's a username, password, login field. And as you can see, now it's recommending me. OK, do you want to log in using these saved usernames? So you can basically use these also. So if you have set up your front end properly like this, then you can also use these recommendations. So we'll get more in depth uh, to this tomorrow. So that almost covers everything we had to cover for today. So now we'll have some doubts. So hopefully, we have lots of doubts because we covered lots of things as basics. So just lay on the doubts one by one, and I'll try to answer them if I can. So just you can just unmute. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, because you can just unmute and ask your doubts. 
Hi, Sain. Uh, I yeah. was just uh, uh, in the other meet and uh, I just got the your meets uh, link in the email right now. So what was covered today? Oh, I guess you were uh, assigned to a wrong batch, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To this. yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, no need to worry because we have recorded the session, right? So I'll send the uh, recording link to you. Uh, just uh, drop your email ID in the chat so that I uh, know where to text you. Hopefully, we'll receive the like updated list of students also from the team. But then, just to be safe, just drop your email in the chat. Yes. Uh, sir. Yeah, I'll add you to the G space also. So I'll just share. So yeah, sure, sure. So what we covered today is basically wait. I'll share this link which you can go over. And so this is basically all the timelines and things we are going to cover through this so for this session so what we did is basically this one today's uh was day one so there's a accompanying video which is around seven hours so seven hours seven days so more or less one hour each so every day i would expect basically everyone to at least uh watch this even if not at 1x so maybe at least at 2x so just uh, watch the given time. So today was basically from 0, 0 to 1 hour, 9 minutes. So just go over it pretty basically. You don't have to like follow along or anything. Just so that you know what we are going to cover that day. So today we covered all these things. We did a basic wireframe of the system. We, we then converted that wireframe into Figma design. Then we designed the database, like a rough schema of the database. Then we went over how the project directory should be structured. And then we saw some basic of Git setup. So I didn't go much into depth in this because uh, I expect you people may not know Git. Uh, so I have also added a resource. So you can see there's a link here for resources, which will be basically this. So there, there are some resources here. So just go over this WSL and Git link. So this will help you uh, catch up to speed. If you are using Windows and don't know about terminals much, you can watch this. And if you don't know about Git also, this will have some basic Git things. And also, the this is basically the same video as uh, this one. Yeah. And if you want to revise any mad uh, things, I've added one note. But then if you have your own notes, you can uh, refer that. That would be better. But then this is just one note that I have. And yeah, so we did these today. And VNV also, so I would recommend if anyone was facing trouble, just try to set up VNV in your system after this. And we just touched upon. A little on secrets. So I have not gone into how to load the .env into Python, but then we saw what is .env, why we need it, and all that. So tomorrow we'll be basically covering all these. So I would recommend to watch. So if you have not watched from 0 to 1, so basically uh, just watch from 0 to 149, 1 hour 49 minutes. And you can just watch it at 1.5 or 2x speed. The video is a little slow. so. You don't have to follow along and just watch till here so that we'll have a basic idea of what we are going to do tomorrow and then uh, these are the extra items which we are going to do so because this was a video and then this is a live stream right so we'll also have some extra things to do and these are the things so after each day so like up today i'll recommend you to go through these things so uh, it's totally up to you if you do but then because uh, this boot camp is for your benefit so these are things if you are revising or if you're learning a little even a little bit in details it will help you to understand the concepts better and i've also added some resources for these in the resources one so uh, sorry not this the resources one yeah so as i said uh, the figma right so we touched figma very basics but then if you want to now learn a little bit more of how to design things in figma I've also added a very good session on that, which is not very long. It's like one hour long. So, but then it has lots of doubts in between, so you can just skip around. So this is a very good session. You can refer to that. So similarly, other resources also I have added. And then if I come up with some other interesting resource also, I'll keep adding it here, and I'll send it in the G space. So I'll give you all the things uh, and all the resources. But then in the end, the onus is upon you to like follow along and watch those right so because this boot camp uh, it's conducted near the start of the term so that you can get your feet wet and 
uh, get started with how to make the project so that the rest of the term you feel confident enough because the main thing which we have seen uh, happen is that people will keep on procrastinating because they think okay i don't know how to make the project and maybe i'll learn then i'll do maybe i'll learn then i'll do and then the term end comes right so and then people try to learn. <laughs> yeah and if it is it doesn't happen so people can't finish it so best is to just start early and then if you know how to do the things or if you know okay i have this tutorial which i can follow to get up to speed then you can easily do this project in one week so easily Shem, you, you mentioned that you share some contents or something which you are finding interesting in G Space, right? What, uh, what is it? Yeah, you are referring to G Meet or I mean chat or no? No, I'll share uh, if I come up with anything else in the G Space also. But uh, uh, right now, all the resources I've added in this resources sheet. Okay, you'll share it in this docs, right? No, yeah, I it's there. G Space, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll share it again. So I've sent this in the email, I think. I'll send this link in the G space. So this link also has this resources link. Right, so yeah, let me close all this. Yeah, any doubts in anything we covered today? So we covered a vast array of topics and it was because it's the starting, so you'll, you're bound to have lots of doubts. So. We can discuss any doubts you have today, and then if you are still having some doubts, you can go over the resources, right? And then try to Google some things up. So that's also one of the skills important for the project, right? So for Mad1, Mad2, both is the skill for Googling. So if you're getting into an error, try to read the error. If you don't understand, read it again. And then if you still don't understand, just copy the errors first line or second line and paste it into Stack Overflow. So as I even showed that we were facing some error that, okay, the index method is not returning something. So we can, so with uh, experience, you'll understand what that error means in like one second of reading it. But then at first you'll have to try to understand what it means. Maybe you have to search it. Maybe in Stack Overflow, you'll get an answer. Okay, this means this. And then, so this uh, continuous process of reading errors and then debugging and fixing the errors will uh, in the end make you proficient in the programming. Because uh, practice is basically the only thing you can do in programming, right? So. Just after every day, just try to do the things uh, which we have done. So it will, and like do it yourself by coding it. So it will help you understand how to do it. Uh, what is G space? G space is basically this one, right? So I don't know if I should open it because I may have other G space open, but uh, basically uh, it is the chat. If you open Gmail and if you, so in there you will have one chat option and one. Uh, so I think I can show with some other account. Yeah, so if you open mail, like not this. Yeah, if you open mail, yes. so you can see that it will open mail like this. So here you will have a chat here, right? So you can click on chat and so the top part is your personal messages, people who are who you are messaging, and here you will see spaces, right? So if you open this in your IITM account, you will see one space here called uh, AppDev. So let me see what the name was, I forgot. Something like uh, Mad1 Project. So that is basically where uh, us 26 people are there. So uh, any updates or anything, I'll just push there, because mailing every time it may be hectic and some people may miss it. So this will this is basically like a group chat, right? So okay. it's inside yeah. Google. So, I got it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, where will we get the recording? So uh, I've started the recording, and usually in Google Meet, it takes one or two hours to process the recording once I've ended it. So uh, you can expect it at uh, earliest by let's say four or five p.m. So uh, I'll get the link and I'll share it in the G Space. I'll also create a sheet in there. So maybe in the same resources sheet, I can add it. So every day, I'll basically put the links there. And also I'll also send it in the G Space. So basically, all the information I'll share in the G Space. So if you have any doubts also, you can ping me up there. And I'll, I'll re respect, uh, reply there. That's great, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I was a little to contact you in case. Yeah. yeah. For some us. The, let's spend no worries. It's like a group in WhatsApp, but yeah, exactly. Tanish said it right. So it's basically like what if you stuck for us, we, we I, I, basically I lose some interest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
uh, and uh, I guess that's the one of the other reasons of this bootcamp also, right? So if you're doing it just by ourselves, we lose the motivation. But then if you're doing like uh, 20, 25 people together, one person will motivate the other, one will help the yeah. other. That's really helpful. Yeah. Uh, I think I uh, I'm not added in your G space. I was uh, wrongly allocated uh, earlier. Yeah, 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 I know. So you just send me your uh, email ID here and I'll add it to the G space. They should also send me an updated list, but then just to be safe, you send me your uh, email ID in the, the in this chat. I sent it. Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah. Yeah, I've saved it. I'll I'll add you to the G space. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. So any doubts regarding uh, today's session? So Devatam, I guess you joined late. So uh, only after the seeing the recording, you may have doubts. But then uh, people who were here, any doubts of the contents we covered today? Uh, no, from my side. Maybe uh, I try to do it. Yeah, try to set the VN up, see if it's yeah. working. Yeah. Maybe tomorrow I can do it parallel along with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, yeah. Also do, uh, like, like watch that uh, some part like from 00 to 149, 1 hour 49 minutes of the video. So don't have to like watch it properly. Just go over it so that you know what we're going to cover that day. Sure. Yeah. All right then. Uh, so if you have any doubts, we can discuss it. Otherwise, also, it's fine. So if you want an early break, we can dissolve early. That's not a problem. So if you have any doubts, you can also ask in the G space. Sure, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. So I guess, yeah, if, if no other doubts, so just let me know. And, and like by 40, I guess we can then wind up this. And we, yeah, 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 so the session of today is basically over. So I was just waiting if anyone has any doubts. So uh, by the looks of it, I don't think anyone does. So yeah, even if you get any doubts later or may want to refer to the video first and then ask doubts, it's fine. We can uh, like discuss those in the G space after hours. So then, yeah, we'll meet again tomorrow, same time at 10 a.m. Right. So uh, see you again tomorrow. Just go over the sources for today and uh, the video for tomorrow. All right, then. Bye bye. I'll end the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.